I was approached a couple of years ago about it. Now to us, data is data. It doesn't take a side. We try not to meet the clients. We try not to get involved with them. We only do data. So I thought it was an interesting case. And again, it doesn't matter who's involved. We don't listen to the narrative. We listen to the data. So you never actually met Johnny Depp before the trial? Hi there. Welcome to the podcast from Tech Wellness, Thriving with Technology. I'm August Bryce. And today, it's an amazing show. We are going to go behind the scenes with a witness of the Amber Heard Johnny Depp defamation lawsuit. And you're not going to hear this anywhere else. Brian Neumeister is speaking exclusively to us. Brian Neumeister is the CEO of USA Forensic, and he's also the digital expert for Johnny Depp's legal team in the lawsuit with Amber Heard. And he will be here to share some behind the scenes insight into his testimony. It's really good. He had to review over 65,000 images for this trial. And you know what? In the end, Newsweek called his testimony the second most important moment in the proceedings and a big part of why Johnny Depp prevailed. So we're also going to discuss after we talk about the lawsuit, we're going to talk about Brian's advice for all of us based on his decades of experience and how to keep your pictures and your text messages and my text messages and my pictures and all of our online activity as safe and as private as it can possibly be. But before we get into that, I just want to share, I have been really happy to see so many of the five-star reviews on the podcast. It's so cool. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And I know you've heard, I'm sure, because I listen to podcasts all the time, that these reviews are super important in terms of other people being able to find and learn and listen to the show. So thank you. Thank you so much. And if you haven't reviewed us, please, please do. And, you know, tell your friends about the Tech Wellness Podcast. I think they enjoy it. So now with our exclusive chat with Brian Neumeister, if you look at techwellness.com and you look under experts, you're going to find Brian there. This is our third podcast with Brian, and he's an amazing digital forensics expert. And you know what? I've known him professionally. Really? Gosh, it's been years. He works with law enforcement and the courts and the military. And he's really been involved in just so many high profile trials in the last several years. Okay, think about this. Since the Depp Heard trial ended a few weeks ago, Brian and his team at USA Forensic have handled nearly 20 more cases. Yes. And so here's what they do they clarify and uncover data from our cell phones, <laughs> including you know, using the cell towers to understand location and travel, uh, computer data, all sorts of things that people have tried to erase, but were still findable by Brian. Digital pictures and videos that can really reveal this interesting and very important information. So Brian told us that being in court these days feels a lot like being at home. Oh. But if you were one of the millions of people who tuned into the trial, you know, things got pretty intense. So I want to start out with this scene from the courtroom. This is the actual audio from a really pivotal moment when Brian tells Amber Heard's attorney the bottom line of some of those photos he was asked to evaluate. Listen to this. Oh, that's not a yes or no question because a lot of the exhibits that you have um, put up, they're not photographs. They're screen grabs, and they've been changed from a, a Apple format, which is JPEG, J, JPEG, to a JPG Microsoft format. So you have actually changed the exemplars. You've changed the data yourselves. Hey, Brian, it's so good to talk to you again. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure yeah, to mine. Great. Thank you for being here. It's been an interesting and exciting few months for you, right? Yes, we've been very busy. Yeah, an expert witness for Johnny Depp's team in his defamation trial against his ex-wife, Amber Heard. So much coverage of the trial. It's funny because I've had 19 cases since we got back from that. So that's just one case. So, but yes, a lot of coverage, a lot of media coverage. 
Yeah, and how everyone's rallied around Johnny Depp. So I want to say something from the top. This whole thing is very delicate. I do want our listeners to know that I've known you for a very, very long time, and you are a good man and would never do anything to minimize domestic abuse or violence. Oh, absolutely. Right. So I I don't want that to be the focus of our visit today. I want to get a little behind the scenes perspective, and I want our listeners to learn a little bit about the pictures they take and the data on those pictures and what it means to them or what it can mean to them in the future. Okay. Okay. So you're one of the busiest and most respected people in digital forensics. And I know, Bri, you're turning down more cases than you can take. And after looking at this case, why did you think it was important to be involved? I'm sort of limited to what I can say, of course, but I uh, was approached a couple of years ago about it. Now to us, data is data. It doesn't take a side. We try not to meet the clients. We try not to get involved with them. We only do data. So I thought it was an interesting case. And again, it doesn't matter who's involved. We don't listen to the narrative. We listen to the data. So you never actually met Johnny Depp before the trial? No, I I make sure that no matter who we were dealing with, and we deal with a lot of fairly well-known people, uh, we ask not to meet with them, even though they may want to meet with us, in order not to bias our findings. We want to be totally unbiased because, again, to us, data is data, and it takes no side. So we want to be completely unbiased. Uh, So no, I did not meet him at all before the trial. I appreciate that. But did you get to shake his hand after? As a guitarist to another guitarist, I briefly said one sentence to him. I said, humbucker or P90, which are two different types of pickups. He was walking out of the courtroom. I was walking. Uh, I had just finished testifying. And he said, humbucker. So uh, <laughs> and that was just a little guitarist nod. That is the only, well, only sentence I spoke to him. But again, it's not my job to be involved with the client. It's the job of the attorneys. So I just wanted to give him a little guitar nod. But uh, <laughs> That's he, great he smiled. He, he dug it. So, uh, But yeah, again, the team, can't see enough about the team. Absolutely stunning team. And why, specifically? Uh, they were working 21-hour days at least. Const- their research is phenomenal, and their insight and preparation is phenomenal. And they never try to influence my data. In other words, mm. they, they never tried to say, do this or do that. They would just say, what do you need to do what you need to do? And that's a perfect scenario. Wow, that's great. That's good information. Thank you. Sure, I'm sure people will be happy to know this about you and about the team and yeah. about, you know, just the way that you handle yourself in your business. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. It, again, this is a business of data and honesty. If you compromise yourself, you're done. And, and why would you? We constantly have conversations. What is the right thing to do? Because very often you get into an area where it's kind of gray and I'm like, okay, what's the morally correct thing to do? And that's the way we operate. How did they find you? How did Camille and the team find you? Um, I believe I was contacted after the English trial. I'm not exactly sure, again, because we get a lot of cases, a lot of cases. And I just remember originally being contacted by either Camille or Stephanie about taking a look at some of the data. And so I said, okay. And so can you give us any little behind the scenes tidbit that really stands out in your mind that you can talk about right now? Well, I think a a thing to look at in any sort of trial is I'm going to start with jury fatigue because Mm -hmm. we came on late in the trial and there's always strategic planning, but we came on late in the trial as rebuttal witnesses. So we're very limited what we can talk about, which is actually kind of good because I started out with over 65,000 photos uh, and a lot of them were given to us the day before my report was due. Wait, so, wait, wait, say that again. You were given how many photos? Around 65,000. They were given to me over the uh, the course of a few months, but the last batch of about 6,000 arrived the day before my report was due. So you got to remember there's thousands of lines of EXIF and metadata with every photo. So to go through that is just about an impossible task. So out of 65,000 or so photos, you don't know which ones they're going to use as their trial exhibits. So instead of giving you the 15 or so they're going to use as trial exhibits, they give you 65,000 and you have to go through every one of them and try to figure out the file paths of these. And uh, is there a legitimate way to validate these? Did you actually do that? Did you actually spend the time looking at 65,000 photos? Yes, I did. It took months and it was uh, pretty tedious. 
Wow. Okay. So Newsweek said that your testimony about the photo editing was the second most important moment in the trial, right next to that whole thing about Johnny losing the tip of his finger. So did that surprise you that they said that about your testimony? Um, you know, it's really weird. Uh, we have a different perspective. First of all, the legal team was amazing. Just absolutely first-class legal team that uh, Mr. Depp had. I knew from the get-go, for example, what really shocked me is when they did show us their trial exhibits, the data was originally taken with an iPhone, supposedly. But a lot of their exemplars were from Windows, and they were screenshots, not actual photographs. So I hadn't ever seen this in a trial before, and I thought, oh, my goodness, these folks really are not familiar with how to handle data. And a lot of that comes from the fact that very often law school centers around Latin and the actual language today is binary. And attorneys very often are quite behind the curve as are judges, as are a lot of people as to how tech really works. So very often stuff can be passed off. And unless you look under the hood, you don't know what you're getting. So we looked under the hood and we were just kind of blown away. Well, you know what? I was so impressed with your testimony because obviously the whole cross-examination thing was highly choreographed, right? But you would not be railroaded. How did it feel to be on the stand? Um, it, it feels like home. Uh, once you sit down, you're ready. Uh, mm. You don't know what's coming your way, but you know you've got the facts on your side. And so you just have to be patient and stay level-headed and not get excitable. But you would not back down. Um, you can't. They have a narrative. You have facts. They're trying uh -huh. to control the narrative. You're trying to get the facts across the jury. You have no reason to dispute that, correct? Incorrect. Well, isn't data data? That's what you testified to, right? It's very simple to modify XF data. It's, it's, I mean, Did you, you find any evidence phone? in this case of actual modification of EXIF metadata? You can't, you can't authenticate any of these photos because of the way they were. That wasn't my question, Mr. Neumeister. Did you find any evidence of any modification of EXIF metadata of any photograph in this case? You didn't listen to my answer. My answer is there is no way to know because of the way the files were presented. So you felt, but you actually, you found no actual evidence of it, correct? That no one could, I'm not asking way. anyone else could, Mr. Newmeister. I'm asking, did you yourself find, you, you found no evidence of any modification of EXIF metadata of any photograph in this case, correct? Now, I understand trying to control the narrative, but there's no way to answer that scientifically because given the evidence we were given, there is no way to positively or negatively answer that. It's not a question that can be answered. It is, it is a question, Mr. Neumeister. The question is, did you yourself, you found no affirmative evidence of any modification of software exit metadata of any photograph in this case, correct? You, you found no actual evidence of that, did you? No one could tell either way because- I'm not asking about anyone else, Mr. Neumeister. I'm asking about you. Did you, you found no evidence of that, did you? Objection, Your Honor, asked and answered. He's, he's not answered what he found, Your Overruled. Honor. Overruled. There's not a way to answer that the way you're asking the question. You have to restate it. And, and you're trying to control Your Honor, he's not responding to the question. Okay, could you just answer yes or no, sir, to the question? It's not a yes or no question. Did you, yes or no, you found, you found no evidence of EXIF metadata modification of any photograph in this case, correct? That's incorrect. Okay. And so then they presented you with the 15 photos. And when you saw them, were you surprised that those were the photos that they chose? I wasn't surprised at the content. I was surprised at the fact that they would, for example, represent one photo as two different photos. Mm -hmm. It was just mind boggling that they had two exemplars that were the same photo with uh, different chromatic values. It, it was mind blowing. I think when we did the uh, exhibit of uh, kind of merging the two together, mm -hmm. the jury saw that, oh yeah, this is the same photo, just treated differently. And I believe the story behind that was, well, I got up to get a makeup light and turned it on. One of the thing is every single hair, every eyelash, every everything is overlays 100%. There's no doubt it's the same photo treated Plus, behind one of them, if you look at the EXIF data, which is the embedded data in a photograph, it said that it went through a photo editing app. So it's not hard to put two and two together. Put two and two together for us. What are you saying? 
Well, when you see, without going into exit data very deeply, when you're looking at a photograph, there's a uh, a lot of data that the camera spits out. In the old days, it used to be you wrote down notes about what lens you were using, what f-stop you were using, did the flash fire, that kind of stuff. Exit data on a digital camera tells you all that and much more. There's about a thousand lines of stuff. It can tell you what software version you were running, what type of iPhone was shooting it, or what type of Android was shooting it. So you can go through the, the data that is behind the photo to understand it. Now, an original photo... There's a lot of ways to look at it, but the only way to really know if it's original is to do a forensic examination of the phone, because it's the only way you can track how a file has been handled. But not having any of the phones, just simple iTunes backups, which are not forensic and do not include deleted data, I had to look at and see if the software even matched. And the software, mm. other than saying 9.3.1, which is the current operating system, said Photos 3 or Photos 1, which means it had been through an editing system and saved through an editing system. So, Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Zero doubt. So th- the question then becomes, what was done to it in the edi- editing system? That we can't say because we don't have the registry or the operating system of the machine that did that. So... Anytime you save a photo through another program, you're going to change what's called the hash value, the digital fingerprint of it. And the reason that becomes important is chain of custody. So when you change a hash value or digital fingerprint, you've changed, for example, on a photo, the compression of the photo. If you take a JPEG into Photoshop or Photos 3 and you save it, doesn't matter if you've done anything to the photo, it's going to change the compression on that JPEG. So when we started seeing, you know, a dozen photos where they're, where, where they're all different mm. and we don't have the actual phone to be able to pull up the phone's registry and the Knowledge C database, we're at, what is our chain of custody here? Well, we've got 15 photos or a dozen photos that look different. They're of different sizes. We don't have the actual iPhone. So you're, you're left with what they presented. And in that right. particular uh, presentation of two photos, uh, one had been through a photos editor and the other one had a stock 9.3.1, which is the operating system. The thing is you can also edit on a phone though and save it through the phone and still get the 9.3.1 operating system. So it gets very complex without having the phone to look at. And as I said, 95% of cases we do, it doesn't matter if they're 10, 12 years old or whatever. If it involves a phone, the phone is available. People do yeah, not. Why, why, where was the phone? People do not throw out evidence. From what I understood, and I may be incorrect, but I understood that uh, the phones were no longer available or they'd been thrown away or something. But usually when people have evidence, they don't throw it out. They keep it. And, you know, mm-hmm. every case we have, it's really important to do a deeper dive into a phone to see what's been deleted, to see how files have been handled. Without that, you have nothing but the surface of the cake. You have the icing of the cake, but you don't know what the cake's made out of. Right. And and it was so interesting watching Hurd's attorney just try to get you to to limit your testimony to, well, are these fake or not? Oh, you can't tell. You can't tell. You can't tell. Right. That's what he was trying to do. But you made it really clear that they were all different, that something had happened to well, that photo. Again, it's called controlling the narrative. And you'll see that in every trial. Everybody wants to control the narrative. Every attorney does. And there's times when that's fine, as long as they give you the bandwidth to answer the question correctly. Uh, The fact that I wasn't even allowed to testify about the color of the photographs, you know, obviously the colors or the chromatic values were different on the photos. I wasn't allowed to testify about that. So if you're, Mm -hmm. if you're saying a few different things and they tend to bring it up in an objection and it gets overruled, then you've opened the door for that type of testimony. Uh, there are two separate exhibits, except it's the exact same photograph that's been, uh, one's been edited, one hasn't, or I can't say that one hasn't, but uh, the colors have been uh, modified in an editor. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, beyond the scope of your ruling, talking about colors. First of all, you can't, I can't, nobody can identify the authenticity of the photos, of any of the photos. So it's, mm-hmm. it's really a game of chess. It was, and you were so calm and cool and collected. I kept thinking, wow, everyone's going to want this man to be on their side because you were just, you just had all the information and you would not let him turn it around on you. Well, I think it, it boils down to do the right thing. It always, mm. it always has. I mean, what is the correct data? We won't work a case 
where the data isn't correct. In other words, if we feel funky about the data, we're going to say, nope, we're, we're not working this. We're going to uh, you know, turn it back to you. We can be consultants, but we will not be your forensic team. So mm-hmm. once I looked at the data, I thought there was enough going there to be on the, uh, on the forensic team. Okay. And so when you did, just so that people really clearly get this, what data did you see on the photos, on all the photos that you saw? Was it all consistent? No. And I'm going to kind of narrow it down to what I've already said. I stay out of the legal team's hair. I, again, I, <laughs> my focus is very narrow. I do not okay. talk to the client. I do not meet with the client because okay. I stay away from narrative. I just do data. So as far as what's going to be done from here out, if anything, uh, I, do, I would not want to jeopardize that in any way. Got but it. what I saw was irregularities in what's called the EXIF data. And that is the data about the photographs. And, and that I testified to, so I know I can talk about it. Okay. So what can we all learn about the safety and security of the pictures that we take on our phones? One of the things is if there's something on your phone, an iCloud backup is, is, is a good situation, but does not back up the operating system. So if there is uh, something that you want to save uh, that is so amazing that you want to be able to prove it in a forensic manner, you want to have a forensic extraction done of that phone. And, and we do this for Fortune 500 companies. We just finished a, a case with a, with a royal family that shall remain nameless that turned out real well. But it was a matter of a letter of preservation to preserve the original uh, materials. Uh, so that becomes very crucial to, to preserve the original photos on the original phone they were taken on. Uh, if you get something horrific and you want to use it in court, you might want to have a forensic backup of the phone done just so that it doesn't become an issue, a chain of custody issue later in a case. Wow. And so can we destroy our original photos or is it only by losing a phone? Well, there are a few things you can look at. One of them would be geodata would be important, which is geography. UTC, which is universal time code minus whatever time zone you're in. The EXIF data and how that would relate to a normal photo taken from that model of of iPhone on that operating system. You're looking for deviations from the norm. So if you did an iCloud backup, there's a pretty good chance that uh, you'd be better off than an iTunes backup. Of course, they don't even do iTunes anymore backups, but an iCloud backup is not terrible, but it's not nearly as good if it gets down to brass tacks as having the actual phone. And so you have to have the phone to do that. Yes, we get a lot of phones FedEx to us. I'd say we do 200 phones a year, something like that. And they can be anything from Fortune 500 to to the Innocence Project. Uh, We do work with law enforcement as well. So it depends on the case and what is needed. Okay. So getting back to my pictures on my phone, if I don't want them to be public someday, not that they're going to be in a trial, of course, but if I just want to protect the privacy of my photos, what do you suggest? Well, first of all, if you were to delete them from your iPhone, <clears throat> I, w- I could recover them unless they've been written over. Now, n- doing a normal forensic extraction, like a logical extraction, you would not recover those deleted photos. If you do what's called a checkmate extraction, which is a different type of extraction, it's called an exploit using mm-hmm. Celebrite or Gray Key, you can get all this deleted data Unless it's been overwritten. How do you so, do that? Well, overwritten is just done by time. It's just, uh, you know, basically, one, you can, time will eventually overwrite files. Two, you can actually use on your computer software that will shred the backup. Mm, those really well, work. Yes, it works very well. Uh, you know, we've, we've had to do that for Fortune 500 companies where they want uh, specific data eliminated because it's trade secret stuff and they want to keep the other stuff. So, yes, it can be surgically done, but it can't be done on the phone. It has to be done on a computer. Can, can I do that at home? Yes. There are software programs like Dr. Phone, I believe it's called. Just that, that would be a consumer one mm-hmm. uh, that will let you do that sort of editing. And so then if I want to save my pictures... And I'm not worried about the data on them. Backing up to iCloud is better than backing up to your computer? Yeah, it, it is because there's a number of different uh, log files and stuff that go with it that, that would be pertinent. You're not going to back up the operating system, but you are going to uh, back up a lot of the uh, data that would go with it. But again, if it's something you really want to use in a legal situation, preserve the phone. Mm, do an okay. forensic extraction of the phone. And we do this a lot. They can be pretty high profile and we want to get a something that we know is rock solid in court. So a forensic extraction is the way to go. Okay. So really, if I want to protect my own pictures and my own data, but I don't want to get rid of my pictures, 
what do you suggest? I just want to keep them private. Well, first of all, get them off your phone. If you're not going to use them in court, you want to save them somewhere. I would just build an encrypted folder either on my phone or an encrypted folder on my computer, save them there. <coughs> there are various apps that can do that, but getting them off the phone would be key. So, and again, there are apps that you can encrypt on your phone, but we can usually hack those because we get asked a lot to, to get into encrypted files. The best way is to remove from your phone and then the odds are it'd be very hard to get them back. Maybe put them on a backup drive? Sure. I mean, It's not even on a computer? Pardon? That's not even on the computer, like a backup drive. Is that oh, safer? Absolutely. Yeah, an encrypted backup drive. I mean, they make thumb drives with, with encryption that we use all the time that are, that are good. Again, the most important thing about a backup is make sure that your password is 14 uh, letters or more. Mm -hmm. um, people always type in like their birth date or the name of their cat or something. That's really easy to crack. We can do about 2 billion passwords with a B, 2 billion uh, a minute. Mm -hmm. So there are rainbow tables or what we call uh, databases of the most common passwords. So the first <laughs> thing you do is run 100,000 of those in a second to see if it'll open. And very often it does because people use their, their, their street address, their phone, whatever for backup. They want something they can remember. So you want to use something that is just like a phrase or something. It can be yes. a very simple phrase. But it just means something to you. Yes. Yeah. It's not and, common. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be really anything special. It just has to be 14 characters or longer. A 14 characters is fine. Because what happens mathematically when you're decrypting things, the larger the number, it, it grows geometrically. So once you're up past 11, uh, you're starting to get into really large numbers for hashing for, I mean, for decrypting. It can be just a phrase that you will remember. Yeah, uh, I agree. Different. But did you know Apple is trying to move away from password, uh, passwords on iOS 16? Yes. Like, what um, do you think about that? What they're using is, it's kind of like a FIDO system. It's basically where your ID is on the internet. Now, anything that goes up on the internet, the question is not, <laughs> can it be hacked? Is when can it be hacked? Right. Um, I don't know the full implementation of it. I'm sure there's a two or three party authentication on it. Apple in general is very good with security. It'll be interesting to see. I haven't seen a white paper on it yet. I've seen the basics on it. And to the user, it won't look that much different. It's just that it also ties a lot of your different Apple products together so that you mm -hmm. can, you know, no matter where you are, the question is, uh, how safe is is it? Apple does a very good job with safety, and they're they're very good with privacy. So, I mean, as far as not getting it out to people, in other words, law enforcement to get it, it's very difficult uh, for us to get stuff. is very difficult, which is good. People mm -hmm. don't want all their data getting out there. And you know, as I've said many times before, the cell phone is the dumpster of the human soul. People do stuff on a cell phone they would never do anywhere else. I mean, they say stuff on a cell phone they would never say. They text stuff they would never say. They take photographs and send them of stuff they would never do any other way. It's mm -hmm. it's amazing what you find on cell phones. It's really sad. And it's and that's part of tech wellness is just being mindful and aware that this personal private possession of yours, your phone, some people think it's an appendage, it really isn't. It's not personal. It's not private. No. It's the internet. It's the World Wide Web. There are so many ways that it can be hacked. Well, and that's why you want a VPN on your phone, which is a very simple app. It costs a few bucks a month. It's an app that disguises where you're at. It basically changes your IP number, IP address. So, for example, I'm living in Gross Point Farms, Michigan. I use an IP out of Chicago or out of Washington, D.C. It depends. It's just a button mm -hmm. push. Right. And you definitely want a content blocker. And and the reason is, and I'm just going to name one because I use it. It's called One Blocker. I don't have any ties to the company, but I find mm -hmm. it's very good for keeping out uh, snooping. Because every app on your phone has at least six different ways to snoop on you. And the reason they do that is they sell your data. So you're like, how did I get this free cool weather app? Well, they're selling your data. If you're using a content blocker, uh, such as one blocker, it really limits the amount of data they can get from you. The other point to that being- yeah, Let's that, talk about that a little bit more, the, yeah. the data. So what a content blocker does is stop trackers and cookies or alert you to them. Tell us exactly how they work. Uh, you can select them. And I'll, a lot of times, if you do block everything like I do, a lot of websites will try to ask you to turn off your blocker, in, in mm -hmm. which case uh, I'll just go to a different website. 
Because a lot of websites want your information so they can use you in a database. Exactly. Um, one of the most important things is like if you have your phone completely wide open and you're driving around, your Wi-Fi is going to be pinging off of Starbucks. It's going to be pinging off McDonald's. It's going to tell people what your patterns are. So advertisers can do what's called target advertising. They can advertise in your area because you're next to this Walgreens or this CVS. They can advertise the bagel shop that's right next to there. Now, in a lot of ways, that's good for local business, but do you really want your habits known to everybody? Not at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've never, ever turned on my location services, ever. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon as I open my, as soon as I turn on my phone, I go directly to settings and I turn off Wi-Fi and I turn off Bluetooth. Absolutely. The other thing is too, um, and I believe, uh, you know, a Faraday bag to people who don't know what they are is an extremely important thing to have for your phone. Uh, One of our at, top sellers. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I know you do that. And there, you have excellent bags, by the way. And I'm not you know, you. in any way uh, related to the, the bags you sell, but they're excellent. People don't realize a couple of things I'd recommend with phones. First of all, don't put them up next to your head. Thank uh, you. Use earbuds. Uh, people just don't realize the output of these phones. You're looking at a quarter watt of radiation right next to your dome. So um, it's just like sticking your head in the microwave, only overdrawn out over a longer period of time. Use earbuds. Say it. It'll just, not AirPods. Brian is not saying use AirPods. <laughs> he's saying use AirTube headset. That's what he's saying. Yeah, Bluetooth headsets. headsets uh, right. So You're not I'm just saying, saying any 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 brand you like. But right. um, I always have two sets, and the reason is because I have them on so long, they die out in the middle of the day. I'm sending you some new ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm using uh, you know the, the, the AirTube. I mean, I'm using yeah, Apple Apple. or whatever the deal is, but I have it on all day long. So, and I've got noise canceling on in the, in the lab. Oh my so, gosh, Brian, Bluetooth is just as bad. I can't uh, believe you're saying this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not nearly the wattage. Uh, but uh, Yes, it's not nearly the wattage. However, it's on, especially AirPods are on all the time. Yep. Now, I know you have some of my AirTube headsets, so I'm going to send you another pair of AirTube you do that. headsets for that. you and your beautiful wife, yep. because I know they're not as you know elegant and sleek and clean as just having uh, no wires, yep. but you are worth it. Your brain is worth it. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the data on the photos. I just yep. want to summarize for everyone, so we're not backing up to iCloud. Right. If, if we want to protect the privacy of our photos. Right. Now you can select on your phone and I'm just going to talk on an iPhone, but they're all the same. You can select what you want to back up. And here's the thing about an iTunes backup. A stock iTunes backup is about five gigabytes, which is nothing. So most people opt for, I think it's 295 a month to go up to 200 gigabytes. You can go through your apps and select if you want them to back up. So you can go through and say, no, I don't want to back up my weather. I don't want to back up my games. I don't want to back up my photos. I don't want to back up my texts, that sort of thing. So you can go into your settings and control what you want to back up. You know, that saves space. And also you're not backing up a bunch of app data for stuff you will never use. I mean, I don't really need my Delta Airlines app backing up a bunch of stuff. There's exactly. no reason for it. So it's a matter of going through it and, it wouldn't be a bad idea to literally put together a pamphlet on, on, on a lot of things that should be done safety wise, because when you get a phone, they're wide open. They're just like, they're just like a wide open door. There's a lot of ways to, to shut down a lot of things and it changes with operating systems. Top three ways to, to shut it down, as you say. Limit any kind of tracking from your uh, uh, app. For example, you could turn off your location services with every app you have. Now you might need it for your maps app, but location services are on everything. It can be you're playing Angry Birds. It can have a location service on you. So whenever you turn on that app, it's locating you. A terrible idea. Turn off your microphone and turn off your camera to every app that doesn't specifically need it. They all ask for access. Those would just be three, you know, top three ones. Things. Easy. But you said something earlier that I really haven't talked a lot about, and that is if your Wi-Fi is on or even your Bluetooth, you're pinging the location that you're at, even if your location services are off. Let's talk about Wi-Fi. Your Wi-Fi is trying to do a handshake with any other Wi-Fi. If you walk into a mall and you look at your Wi-Fi on your settings, you'll see there's a zillion different places it's trying to connect. Every time it does that, it leaves a record of a, of a handshake whenever it makes a, a connection. 
So identifying we, my phone with yes. okay. It, it identify your MZ, which is the, the your your phone. Actually, not so much your your phone, but your uh, SIM card. Okay. Identifying your SIM card with a place. So the thing is, you're giving away a lot of data. That why would you want to give that away? We use it for locating people very often. You know, GPS data on apps. There's so many apps that use GPS data like Lyft or Signal mm-hmm. or whatever. So if we're trying to track somebody through their cell phone, it's very easy to find it because so many apps use satellite. Uh, Google uses it. It's great for navigation, but it's also very easy to find somebody and, and to know their habits. If somebody knows your habits, they know where you're going to be when. Just really common sense things. Just go into your into your settings and shut off things that you don't specifically need. But Wi-Fi is always going to be running down your battery by searching for a handshake. And then the same with the cell tower, but is that just limited to where the towers are? Or if I'm walking by that store and, you know, there's a cell phone tower nearby, will they ping the store and my phone at the same time? That's a really interesting and a long question. It's a great question, but cell towers are not proximity uh, based. They're based on signal noise ratio. So it's not always going to hit the nearest tower. It's going to hit the tower with the best signal to noise ratio. Your phone will be what's called racked and stacked with the tower, for example, at your house that you use the most. It's going to have what's it's called a rack and stack. It's going to always try to default to that. If you reset your phone, it's going to try it all over again. It's going to, it's going to hunt for it. If you How look at no, just turn it off. I mean, just do a cold boot where you hold uh, yes. the uh, volume up and the yes. button off and then slide it. Once you reboot, it's going to start hunting again for a tower. It's going to start hunting again for Wi-Fi. And then it's going to look at your habits. There's a thing on an iPhone called a Knowledge C database that keeps track of your day-to-day habits. It can be anything from your health app to your steps app to how you use your phone. And it tries to make it easier for you by constantly uh, going to the last site that you had good connections with. Now, you could be well out of range of that site. It's still going to try to hold on to that particular site. It's really interesting the way it works. That's a a couple of days worth of talking about. Uh, And that's why I keep my phone in a Faraday. And that's also why I do a hard reset every morning. I don't know if that really protects me or protects my privacy. I do a hard reset on my iPad and my iPhone every morning, as does all of our crew. Okay. And by doing that, what are we doing? We're flushing cache files. The other thing is on Safari, for example, if you're using an iPhone, be sure to go to your history and clear all your history. It's fairly simple. You can either do it in settings or you can do it in Safari. You'll see uh, something that looks like a little book. And you click on that and let the history of everything you searched. There's a button on the bottom that says clear. You can, you can clear for a day or for all time. Clear for all time. You don't want a lot of data about what you do on a day-to-day basis on your phone. It doesn't help you in any way. That's such a good point. It doesn't help me. It's helping the yes. advertisers try to determine what it is that I want, what I sure. need. And data it's, creepy. Is, it's creepy. Well, data is money. Data is money. Data is what people sell. There are so exactly. many people that just sell data. When you think of why did I get this cool game for free or this cool app for free, it's because they're selling your data. They're selling your life. So those are things you want to shut down. Right. And when you say there are so many companies that sell data, it's so true. And they parse out that data and they almost feed you things to direct your life, perhaps in a different direction than you would have gone on your own. Well, the other thing is localized advertising. When you're looking on a phone and you don't have all these things shut down and you're searching for, for example, a car park or something like that. Every ad you see in Google for a while is going to be similar and yes. related to, you know, if you're looking for computer parts, you'll see a lot of ads for computer parts. If you're looking for a restaurant that serves a certain type of meal. You'll see a lot of that. It's localized advertising, which is called targeted advertising, as you well know. But do you really want that? No. No. You know what, Brian, I have to tell you because you know my daughter. Yeah. So and both of them, but I, I tell them constantly, and this has been something for 15 years that I've been saying, turn off your camera, turn off your location, yep. 
turn off your microphone on all of your apps. So they kind of, all right, mom. Well, one of my daughters, Jazz, said, oh my gosh, mom, you are so right. I got into the shower. I put my phone on top of the counter where my shampoo was. I haven't used that shampoo for two years. She was just visiting. And I put it up there within an hour I got an ad on Instagram for that shampoo. Isn't that scary? I scared her. She turned off the camera. I will say this, though. There have been times uh, for kids, I would leave their satellite stuff on because we've done a lot of Amber Alerts or a lot of missing children or missing people. That's very easy by satellite to track them down. And you never know with, with a silver alert, for example, which is an older person getting lost. Being able to ping where they are right at the moment is really helpful for law enforcement. But again, that's for kids. So, or yeah, for, for I, I have people. to ask you about this because yeah. there's this, you know, a lot, so many parents are struggling with their kids using their phones too much, right? Way yeah. too much time on the phone. And then kids younger and younger and younger are getting phones. And I think specifically parents feel very comfortable with it because now they know where they are. Now, some kids do much better with independence and they feel yeah. so great that they don't have a phone. So there's that there's this space of, you know, do we really need to know where they are all the time? And then you say something like this, we get Amber Alerts all the time. Does it? And then I hear, well, actually kids don't go missing that often compared to what we read in the media. So what's the truth? Well, one of the the things is, yeah, it's, it's a very small percentage because it's fairly easy to track them. One of the things I've seen this year, I thought it's been really interesting are the little, I'm not sure the exact name, but the little luggage. Air tags, air air tags. Those things are wonderful for our gear. I've got them in our gear, but criminals are using them to put on cars. Uh, they'll like slap it on the bump of our car, of like an expensive car. They'll track it to the house and then right. that night come and take it. So it's right. a mix. We said it, we did a setup on that. We uh, gave one of the people that works with us an air tag and we tracked her. Yep. And we found all the flaws with the air tag because she wasn't notified for yep. over 24 hours. Yeah. And then when she was notified, she didn't even know that was the notification. It's a really interesting video. It's really interesting to watch. And I know Apple said they're going to be making some changes, which, which was great because yeah. I had about 10 changes that they should make. But you have to be careful with those too because they do have that Bluetooth radiation. So well, you're putting that in a kid's backpack. There's, there's always a double-edged sword when you're dealing with technology. It just, it's just part of technology. So you know, you risk versus reward is what you have to look at. Yeah, right. But even though Apple protects the privacy of the people using their system, they can still see what's on our phone. So Apple can advertise to us or use our data. Is that true? This is what I know I can say legally is that Apple does, the government does, or Apple does have um, access to your backup files. In other words, your iCloud or any kind of Dropbox, anything like that, they do have access to. And so I use Signal, yeah. but where do all of my Apple texts go? You, you're, you're, you mean your regular text Apple texts? Uh, my uh, message. It, it depends if you have them backed up in the cloud or not. I have mine turned off. Mm-hmm. So, But anything you send to somebody is traceable. I would just use Signal. I mean, literally, that's the only thing Congress is allowed to use is Signal. And there have been a few other apps, but none of them has been as safe as Signal so far. Yeah, he's uh, a good guy. The founder. Well, it's peer to peer, and that's the, the thing. It's peer to peer, and the way it's handled is, is pretty well done. So, yeah, Signal is the really only way to go. Thank you, Brian. As always, such an honor to talk to you and to know you. So proud oh. that you're one of our tech wellness experts. Well, I will tell you this: this is the only interview I've done, and uh, the only interview I'm going to do about the case. Just because you, you guys are excellent, and I think it's important, and I I just uh, appreciate you taking the time. No, that's what I'm going to say to you. I appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Are you kidding? Brian Newmeister. Okay. Thank you now. <laughs> that was cool, right? Looking inside the trial everyone has been talking about was super fascinating. And then how about all that important information about ad blocker software and VPNs? Right now, my personal two favorites are the NordVPN and the ProtonVPN. Because remember, when you're using a VPN, 
That VPN service knows all of your browsing history. So you really want to use one that has a nice focus on privacy and those two fit the bill. Those and everything we talked about will be linked at the bottom of the page under the show notes. Oh, I was so excited too and flattered to hear Brian talk about Faraday's. So, and especially loving our Faraday's so much. Are you wondering what a Faraday is and how it works? Okay, so a Faraday cage or a Faraday shield is an enclosure that's used to block electromagnetic fields. And because it does, it's also guaranteeing your privacy because no signal comes in and no signal comes out. And we have these beautiful, finely tailored, 100% protective anti-radiation cases that are really beautiful. And most of them are made by SLNT. And there's one beautiful one that's made especially for women, a cute crossbody Faraday bag that's exclusive to techwellness.com. So I also want you to know our Faraday's All of them have a beautifully made, nice sewn in non-Faraday pocket. So you have a place to put your device when you do want to have signal. And here's really important information. Airplane mode doesn't prevent your smartphone GPS. A lot of people don't really understand this. And when I found out about it, I'm like, okay, that phone is in the Faraday constantly. If you want to keep your whereabouts, your exclusive business, then you pop your phone into a Faraday. The Faraday bag will not allow your phone to receive GPS signal. So that's what a Faraday is. And then we, was that funny when Brian was talking about AirPods and I thought he was talking about AirTube headsets? You must please, if you are interested in protecting that beautiful brain of yours from EMF, please use a wired AirTube headset or You can put your phone on speaker, but if you use a wired air tube headset, you are guaranteeing that there is absolutely no EMF radiation getting into your ears, which is that straight pathway to your brain. So you can look at our website. I also put the the link there for detail on how they work. I also have videos showing you how a Faraday and how the air tube headsets work. So I hope you like and subscribe to our Thriving with Technology podcast because then you will not miss one because sometimes we are inconsistent. They do not come out every week and then sometimes two or three come out a week. If you subscribe, you will not miss any of them. Our mission at Tech Wellness is to empower you to have a healthy, safe, secure, and balanced relationship with digital technology. See you next time. I'm August Bryce. Be well.